Welcome to Salem. This week we are looking at the topic of stewardship, our care for what God has given us to manage in this life. Our care for those things that are not really our own, but are God's. And today we'll see how we can celebrate God's blessings. Whether we have a little or whether we have a lot, we realize that we can still celebrate that and excel in giving. And we'll talk about that more in our lessons, in our prayers, in our devotion, and a little talk at the end of our service as well, too, as we will encourage one another to consider how we can contribute to the work of our Lord here at Salem and in other areas of our lives as well, too. So with that in mind, we have our, our theme of celebrating God's blessings, and we open with the hymn, Brothers, si Brothers Sisters, Let Us Gladly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God, our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy Amen. and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Grant us so firmly to believe in your Son Jesus that our faith may never be found wanting. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You may take your seats. Our first lesson on this day in which we are taking up the topic of stewardship and responding to God's blessings, we have the account of Elijah, excuse me, Elijah and the widow at Zarephath. This widow who was preparing what she thought would be the last meal for herself and her son. She gets a word of promise from God's messenger. And she believes and she offers what from all appearances seemed to be the last of what she had. And she is blessed with more. With exactly what she needs for her daily bread. We read from 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. Then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah 
and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is the word of our God. We sing our Lord's promises in Psalm 31, where we sing of him as the God that saves us, and we will not be afraid because he is with us. Psalm 31, we'll sing this together in unison. Our second lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This will serve as the basis for our devotion and a little, late, a little later this evening. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich." 
This is the word of our God. Please stand. Hallelujah. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Hallelujah. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 12. Here our Lord is there at the temple observing the behaviors of the worshipers there and how they offer their gifts. And he doesn't highlight the grand gifts of those who are able to give much, but he zeroes in on a woman, a widow. A woman who has lost her support system and only has her last two coins. And she gives those. She gives those in complete trust that her Lord will provide. And this, Jesus highlights, as an attitude that excels in the grace of giving. Mark chapter 12. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to them, Jesus said, Tell, I, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the gospel of our Lord. At this time, we join in confessing the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, true God from God made, of one being with the Father, through the end of all things. You may take your seats as we continue with our hymn of the day, All Depends on Our Possessing.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God, your Heavenly Father, and from your Lord, your Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the one who gives you what you need. What comes to mind when I ask you to imagine the place that you would expect to receive the very best of meals? What, what, what environment do you imagine yourself sitting down in in which the very best food you could possibly think of is placed in front of you? Does your mind place you in a Michelin star rated restaurant? There are at least 10 of them in Milwaukee. Maybe a few of you, maybe some of you, and I understand why, but I'm willing to bet that more of you envisioned in your mind sitting down in a place that is much more humble, where the food wasn't crafted with necessarily the best of ingredients, but they're delicious. And the hands that prepared it, maybe they're ones that are very familiar to you, ones that have raised you, ones that have cared for you. And you can just see yourself at ease and at complete comfort knowing that you are cared for in this environment, even though it's not the poshest of places, even though it's not going to make anyone's list of favorite restaurants, but that's where you find yourself comfortable. That's where you feel the love the most. Now, many of us have experiences and stories about the best food that we've ever had. And they sometimes aren't coming from those awesome restaurants that get featured in magazines and on television networks, but they're the holes in the wall. They're the dining room tables in the homes of our loved ones. Humble means can accomplish much. But do we apply that way of thinking when we think about giving generously to our God? Or do we sometimes pigeonhole ourselves and think, you know what, I'll, I'll excel in the grace of giving. I'll give more. I'll give generously when God first gives to me generously. Do we sometimes catch ourselves caught in that sinful frame of mind thinking, I've got to preserve for myself I've got to make sure I have everything that I could possibly want, not just what I need. You know, our, our sinful minds love to grasp onto that misunderstanding. And we love to say, you know what, it's okay if I just consider my giving to God as normal, average, run of the mill. That flies right in the face of the godly advice that we're given today, not just from your pastor, not just later on from a member of our stewardship committee, but from your God. <coughs> your God, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, wants you to excel in the grace of giving. That's the advice that he gives to you. And we'll see that we have examples on how to do this. We have motivation on how to properly do this. And we have a cause to give to, to follow, to follow through on all of this. Our God wants us to be generous on every occasion, like we said in our verse of the day. But this doesn't mean that we dig ourselves into a hole and we create a huge problem of debt for ourselves and what we give. That's not how God classifies excelling in giving. It's not necessarily about the amount, the quantity. It's about the state of your heart. And that's what God wants us to see. For some reason, many of us suffer from the delusion that to excel in the grace of giving, we first have to be rich. We don't. We don't have to be rich in the way the world sees rich. The distinctive part of excelling in the grace of giving is, is that it's an example, it comes from the heart. It's motivated by what our God has done for us. Jesus encouraged us 
And he does so in a heartfelt way. He wants us to, do, to give to him cheerfully, not because he's bending our arm to do so. Just think of our service today. Think of all the examples that we have of excelling in the grace of giving. Our first lesson from the Old Testament. We have that widow at Zarephath. And she was a widow. That meant her safety net, her husband, wasn't there. Didn't have him to provide for her. And it wasn't easy for her to find work, to find gainful employment next to impossible. She would have to survive on picking up whatever scraps she could. And she had a son. And this son was evidently not of working age or was not in the health to do so. So she had to provide for both of them. And we find her in her greatest need. We find her picking up a few sticks to build a small fire so that she can cook the last little bit of flour and oil to make cakes of bread for her and her son as their last meal before they just give up and die. This woman is who God hold, holds up before us as an example of giving and excelling in giving. She's given a word from God's messenger, from Elijah the prophet. A word that asks her to trust something that just doesn't make sense. To trust that the oil isn't going to run out, the flour is going to still be there after she makes a cake for him. She consents. She does it. Even though logically, her mind is probably screaming at her, this doesn't make sense. Oil runs out. Flour doesn't last forever. But her jug never ran out. The flour was still there after the, after the first cake was made for the prophet. She responded in faith and God blessed her. She's an example of how to, of how to excel in giving. And we have more than that. We have the example that Jesus himself holds out before us as he's standing on, in the temple grounds and he's observing the attitudes with which the worshipers are giving their offerings. And he's probably seeing the casualness of how the wealthy are popping in their bags of money into the treasury. And then he sees the widow probably very prayerfully thinking about how God has blessed her and how she has just these last two small coins. Maybe you remember them as being called mites. These copper coins, not worth very much, but they're all she had. And she places them in the treasury, trusting that God will be with her, that God will provide for her. And notice what Jesus highlights about this. Her faith, her trust... He says that because she gave that out of faith, she is giving an offering that is worth more to God than even the pounds of silver and gold that others have placed in that treasury. God is highlighting it's not about the amount. It's about the faith that inspires the gift, the faith that says, look at how much my God has done for me, look at how he continues to care for me, and I trust that he will continue to do so even if I give what I think might be a little bit too much at this time. God isn't commanding you to give any specific amount. But he wants what you give to be a reflection of the faith that you have. And then, we're not just ending there when it comes to the examples that we have. We have another one in the lessons for today. There are countless others in Scripture, but let's just narrow in on the, ones that, the one that we're studying for our devotion from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where Paul is writing to the Corinthian congregation and he brings up an example from another, from another church of their day. He brings up the Macedonians and he brings them up for good reason because they're a church that you know what, you would excuse for not turning in their mission offering. The hardships that they're going through are nothing like you and I ever would hope to know, nothing like you and I have ever have known, but they have been made aware of a great need that the church in Jerusalem has. 
the hardships that they are going through and the need that the church in Jerusalem has. And even though Macedonia is probably one of the other congregations that Paul would like to get together a mission offering for, they respond in hearing of the great need of their fellow Christians and they plead to be able to take part in this mission offering even though they themselves are persecuted for their faith, even though they themselves are by no means living in any form or or mindset of the lap of luxury, they're probably living in worse poverty than we would think of as the poverty line in our own country, translated to those ancient times. They don't have any of the modern luxuries, but they give what they can. And even more so, the Apostle Paul says, more than he is thinking they should, But they want to, they desire to, because they love their fellow Christians that much. Even though they don't know them personally, even though they probably never met them, they want to be sure that the mission work that is going on in other portions of the world is still going to go on. They want to give generously. But the thing is, the examples of generous giving, they don't just stop with the revelation of Scripture. I know of a small, rural, country church that when I first heard of their church mission offering that they give, I thought the decimal point was in the wrong place. It was quadruple what churches five times their size give. They realized that they had enough to be able to do the work that they were given in their community and they were blessed with more than that and they wanted to annually, yearly commit themselves to funding mission work in places that they would never go trusting that God would use their dollars wisely to bring more people to faith to put resources to use for the gospel mission work it still happens to this day God uses the examples of other Christians that we don't know to inspire us to give. Not because of the competition, but so that we can take pleasure in the fact that the faith is creating hearts that are so convinced by the gospel that they can't help but reach out to other people that they'll never know and want to give more. You know, I've seen it in our congregation too. How we have stretched ourselves to build the addition that we have to renovate the campus in other areas. It's been beautiful. But you know, as we've been going about that work, we've noticed some other things. <laughs> some other areas that we'd like to keep improving. Not just because we want it to look nice, not just because we think this would be better, but because we realize this would help us to better serve the community that we're in. There's always more need. And God wants to inspire us to fill those needs. Yes, sometimes with our offerings, other times with our time, and there are so many needs. And if it were just those needs that were motivating us, just those projects on a list that we want to tick off, if that was just our motivation, well then, this would all fall apart. But that's why it's good that our God gives us something better to motivate us. We have our God who motivates us by actually stepping into this world. We have our God who occupied the position that is higher than any of us could have possibly hoped to achieve. You know, a lot of this world teaches us, you know what, you work up your, to the best position you possibly can in this life in order so that you can take it easy. You can coast on into retirement, on into the sunset years of your life. Well, our, our Lord, our God, He had the ultimate position of all authority that was always His. But he saw our great need. And out of his love for us, 
He said, I am going to act. I'm not just going to coast on for all eternity. I'm going to show love to my creation. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to act on the poverty that we had put ourselves in by the fact that we had fallen into temptation. He could have let us dig our own graves deeper and deeper until we ultimately did end up in the eternal pits of hell. It would have been completely in his right to do so, and he would have been perfectly fine for all eternity, but his love motivated him to do otherwise. And we know that love. We know our Savior Jesus who took on flesh and blood. Paul echoes that when he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The one who sat on the throne that is higher than any other throne came and occupied the dirt and grime of this world, came and faced unimaginable torture, came and went through all of this so that he would take on not just human poverty of lack of possessions, which he did, but so that he would take on your spiritual poverty. So that he would take all of your sins that are dragging you, weighing you down to hell, and give you the righteousness that belongs to him. The wealth of heaven for you entirely, yours. He gives that freely. Now that's a tough concept for us to wrap our minds around. But our gospel, our God doesn't just give us words on a page to try and understand. But he takes that concept and he places it into our hands, into our mouths. Today, many of us gathered will come up to this altar and we'll take the position of beggars holding out our hands asking, pleading for something that we could not attain on our own and into your hands will be placed a little wafer of bread from a distance it might be confused for a coin But this object placed in your hand will not have the face of a president or a king or a queen imprinted on it, but embossed on this piece of bread is your Savior, sitting not on the throne of the cross, but on the instrument of torture where he attained your salvation. And this coin-shaped piece of bread is worth more than any amount of wealth that you could hope to attain in this, in this life. Because this is not just bread, it is the very body of your Lord placed into your hand so that you can take it into your, into your mouth and into your body to taste and see that the Lord is good. And it doesn't just end there. You receive that little cup. It doesn't just contain wine, it has the very body and it has the very blood of your Lord in, the, in with and under that wine. And you ingest that and it is a foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb that you will be a part of because your Lord, through his great wealth, won your entrance, gave you the wedding clothes to wear for all eternity. That's what he has given for you. That's the great wealth that is yours even now. A wealth that is worth more than anything your bank accounts could possibly hold. A wealth that is worth more than anything you could possibly place into an offering basket or into our church boxes where, we're, where we've been collecting our offerings for the past two years. Your God gives you more than you could ever hope to. And remember, this is not a competition. 
It's not trying to one-up your fellow believers or one-up God. It's realizing our God has given us so much. And he simply asks us to respond in faith so that the ministry that he has given us to do can go on happening. To respond for the, to the great blessings that he has given us because we realize that we do have a cause. We have a cause because our Lord hasn't returned yet. And we don't know the day or hour that he's returning. And while, while there still is time, we want others to know of this God's gracious heart. And God says we can assist that in excelling in the grace of giving. That's why Paul and his companions urged Titus, as he tells us, just as he had made earlier, made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Paul is saying, I am intentionally sending Titus to remind you of what you have committed yourself to. You have committed yourself to participating in this ministry that we as Christians share together. I want you to respond, not at my command, but motivated by the love of Christ and excel in this grace of giving. He highlights that they excel in many other areas, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in earnestness, in love that was kindled in them, in these Christians, by the message that was brought to them. I can say the same thing about you. About how Salem excels in many areas. That doesn't mean we can slack. We can take it easy in other areas. There are so many needs that we have that go beyond just projects we want to fund. There are the needs of Sunday school teachers. There are the needs of volunteers for events. There are the needs of people to check in on our school families. The needs of people to check in on our homebound members. The needs of people to do elder work and follow up on members that we haven't seen for a while and we want to encourage to be back. And all of this giving in all of these different areas, it's motivated not by tasks that need to be checked off, but by understanding the great love that we have been given by our Lord. So, I want you to understand that you have a cause to rally behind. And you have other examples to follow. Biblical examples. Modern day examples of churches very similar to us. The example of our own past and our own present and how we have responded to needs, but we can't slack off. But we have the greatest of all motivations. That Lord and Savior who came down to serve us, who made it so that if we can't afford to be in the fanciest of restaurants or among the high class of society, he said, that doesn't matter. I still love you and I want you to be a part of this mission. And I want you to consider how you might aid in keeping this going. So today, at the end of our service, we're going to invite our members to grab a commitment card. Hopefully you find one with your name on it. If you don't, I apologize. Maybe there was something that went wrong and we printed off the labels. <clears throat> find your commitment card. And just consider, not out of guilt, but consider how you might this year contribute to the work that the Lord has given us as a body of believers here at Salem to do. And find your ultimate motivation, not in competing with other 
groups of believers, but in what your Lord has done for you. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace that surpasses all understanding guide and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the great me. You may be seated as we continue with our prayer of the church. In our prayers today, we want to keep in our hearts and in our minds Pastor Luis Acosta of Risen Savior, who was hospitalized this week uh, suffering from COVID. And we also want to rejoice with the Sieber family as Theodore Sieber, the newborn son of Emily and Justin, was brought into the family of Christ this past Tuesday through the waters of baptism. We join in praying. Almighty Father, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. You give us time, energy, talents, and treasures. Because of you, we can say with the psalmist, the boundary lines have fallen in for me in pleasant places. Your word teaches us of your great love for us and how to love our neighbor. Give us wisdom in using your gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us that what people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Help us to recognize our true treasure in you, our Savior and our God. Protect us from the devil who would have us marvel at insignificant things as a treasure while neglecting the great gifts that you give us in your word and your sacraments. Give us wisdom in cherishing you and your greater gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, you have set us apart and made our bodies your temple. You live in us. Your word teaches us who we really are by the grace of God. And through the innocent suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, give us wisdom to see that godliness with contentment is great gain and grow in us the fruit that is pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy. And your Lord, at this time we come to you pleading for your mercy on behalf of Pastor Luis Acosta. Be with him and give him strength as he deals with the effects of COVID-19. Be with his family and his physicians as they care for him as well. And grant them peace and patience at this time. We also rejoice that you have made Theodore Sieber your own child through the waters of baptism. Be with Theodore, his parents, Emily and Justin, and his big sister Izzy as they care for him and point him to you as, you as his Savior. And Lord, we ask that you would hear us as we bring you our private petitions in a moment of silent prayer. Accept our prayers for the sake of Jesus, our Savior. Help us to not be arrogant, nor to put our hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but help us put our hope in you, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. For Jesus, our Savior's sake. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom be come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from sin. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Lord, now and forever. Amen. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. We continue with the hymn, We Give Thee But Thine Own. <laughs> 